Hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Eugene Lee Show, and welcome to episode four of Forensics Talks. Uh, today, before we get started with our guest, um, I'm going to make just a, a few announcements here. And um, the first one is that the International Association of Bloodstain Pattern Analysis has opened up their conference uh, November 16th to 20th. And at the moment, there is a call for abstracts. And so um, if you go to their website, you'll actually be able to see, go to the main page. Um, you can also go under conferences and then uh, just click there and you'll see that there's a form here for the abstract submissions. So if you're interested in submitting something there, please do so. Also next week is, uh, somebody reminded me, it's actually Forensic Science Week uh, or National Forensic Science Week in the uh, US. So um, yeah, uh, make sure that uh, you have a look there in case there's any events or that sort of thing. And make sure uh, you know you stay aware of the events. Also, it's not too late to register. Uh, I've been running a shooting reconstruction week, and that uh, consists of a few uh, videos that we're going to be running. And then on Monday, I'm going to be running uh, a, a webinar at 2 p.m. So that's Monday, September 21st at 2 p.m. So if you're interested, uh, you can uh, definitely uh, uh, join in there. Okay, so we're going to get started today with our guest. Uh, I have Dr. Etiel Dror. And um, since 2005, he's been the principal consultant of cognitive consultants in the, uh, the UK. Uh, since 2012, he's been an honor honorary senior researcher for the Center of Forensic Sciences, uh, University College London. From 2019 to 2021, he was appointed by the governor of Massachusetts as a member of the Forensic Science Oversight Board. Uh, he's been awarded many grants. Uh, I let him know just before that he has 144 papers, just so uh, in case he wasn't sure. Uh, he's also been uh, author or co-author co of four books. Um, he has an extensive travel uh, regime with workshops, training, and conferences. Uh, I first met him, oh, probably way back in 2000, and I'm going to say it's 2014 or something at the Canadian Society of Forensic Science Conference. And his CV is absolutely too long to, uh, to uh, talk about. So I'm just going to bring him on. And uh, Dr. Dror, thank you very much for being here. My pleasure. All right. Well, I usually like to start at the beginning, and um, I want to ask you, what first prompted you, if you can go back and remember when you were an undergraduate or, you know, early academic, what what was your interest or your passion about the human mind, or what, what prompted you to move in this particular discipline? The human mind and this discipline is not exactly the same, but if you want me to go very back, you can tell me when to start. I... Uh, my interests go from philosophy, philosophy of mind, trying to understand what underpins the human mind and how we process information. And I remember that I was uh, basing it on uh, children's fairy tales. I remember reading Pinocchio in the story of Pinocchio, you know, the carpenter builds a doll, but it's not a life until, you know, the fairy comes and puts kind of dust, uh, some kind of a uh, spiritual uh, uh, <clears throat> material, you know, on the doll to make it from an uh, inanimate to an animate object. And then I contrast it with the story of Frankenstein, where Frankenstein, uh, the doctor, was building a living creature, not because the fairy came and gave it a soul or a mind, but because of the physical way in which he uh, produced Frank and uh, the monster. So this is kind of very two different constructing perspectives through, you know, story of the human mind. And I was interested in philosophy of mind and studied philosophy. And that's where uh, I started. And maybe I shouldn't say it. I was going to tell you between you and I, but I know other people are listening. <laughs> it's like, you know, people go on Jerry Springer and say secret to the entire nation. <clears throat> but it's not only where I grew, but my real interest is in philosophy. Okay, interesting. Well, that, you know, everybody has something I think that that drives them. And I, and I think that's very interesting. And, and certainly, I think it, your study of the, you know, cognition, human mind and everything, I, I think falls into that. Um, we're going to be talking about bias, obviously. So I want to start with the problem and the 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 frequency of bias, or how big of a problem do you feel bias is 
in the forensic sciences? First of all, you say <clears throat> we're going to talk about bias, obviously. Well, I don't know why, obviously, <laughs> because uh, I study uh, expert decision making, not only in forensic science. I work a lot uh, in aviation, in finance, in the medical domain. And in forensic, it's not only about bias, it's how do people make decisions. However, bias, uh, even before the last few months or years where bias has really turned into a hot topic in society, bias has got a lot of attention, not because it's a sensitive topic, that too, but a lot because the forensic examiners claimed they were unbiased, they were impartial, they were infallible. But my research is not about bias, it's about human decision making, when people make mistakes, when they don't make mistakes, human factors, cognitive factors, and bias is only one part of it that gets a lot of attention because of the response of the forensic community. You know, when I started, the chair of the Fingerprint Society said, none of us are biased, we're all objective, and if anybody is biased, they should go and walk in Disneyland. You know, I'm quoting what he said word by word. So bias got a lot of attention, but it's not about bias, it's about human performance and understanding that in forensic science, the human is very important. Before I came in, it's like the human didn't exist, the elephant in the room. And I was saying, no, the human is very important. The human is part of the process and was totally ignored. They talk about the evidence. And I remember in one of my first workshops, somebody came up and stood up quite angrily and said, the fingerprint doesn't lie. And I was thinking, you know, that was quite clever. But I, you know, after a few seconds, they said, yes, the fingerprint doesn't lie but the fingerprint doesn't speak, right? It's a human person that needs to interpret it. So that's kind of, <clears throat> before I even answer your question, or to answer your question about bias, is it a big problem or not? Well, depending on your criteria of what a big problem is, it depends on how you define a problem. You know, in some domains, uh, they make many mistakes. In the medical domain, you know, the medical errors, many people die because of medical error, and People accept it and they don't think it's a big problem compared to aviation. If one person flies on an airplane, you know, they ground all the airplanes because our society has certain norms and values or I'm not sure what even to call it, what they accepted, acceptable deaths, what's normal, what's not normal. So I don't uh, know what criteria. Is it, okay. is it a problem? Well, it is a problem. And whether it's a small problem or a big problem, whatever is small or big is, which we can discuss for days and not move forward, I think that forensic scientists do a very important job. And no matter if they have big problems or small, minuscule problems, they should always think, are we doing a good job? What are we doing well? What are we not doing well and how we can improve? The only thing I will tell you that I don't accept is saying, which I hope not many people still say, but when I came to work in forensic science, was, you know, 10, 15 years ago, they said, we're perfect. We're infallible. We never make a mistake. And I remember when I submitted my first paper to a forensic journal, one of the reviewers said, well, one plus one equals two. If someone says one and one equals three, does it mean that mathematics is wrong? The person is an idiot. So if any time a mistake is made in forensic science, it's not because of issues in forensic science. That examiner, ex definitio, is incompetent and needs more training because we're perfect and the domain is infallible. That is not uh, true. And I'll add one more thing. Sorry for going on and on and no, on. No, no, no. This is, this is perfect. I work in, in, in the medical domain. I was in a conference giving a keynote <clears throat> in front of 3,000 medical doctors. And I said, how many of you made a mistake? They all picked their hand up. I said, how many of you have killed the patient because you made a mistake? They all picked their hand up. In the forensic conferences <clears throat> 10 years ago, I would say, how many of you made a mistake? Nobody picks their hand up. I said, okay, you don't know you made a mistake, but if you go back to every mistake at every decision you've ever made, could you, maybe you've made a mistake and nobody picks their hand up. They said, it's impossible. So, you know, I'm a bit uh, an odd one. So I went down and started to shake people's hand. They said, why are you shaking our hand? They said, I always wanted to meet God. You know, what does it mean that it's not only you haven't made a mistake, but it's impossible that you've ever made a mistake. This is unacceptable. Yeah. Given now 
the forensic domain has moved forward in the last decade or so, we all know that people make mistakes, even hard working, competent, de dedicated forensic examiners. And whether the, the, it's a big problem or a small problem or a medium problem, we need to look at it to understand it and try to minimize it to do the best we can as experts. Okay. Could you very briefly um, talk about the types or three types of cognitive bias? One, contextual confirmation and expected frequency. Could you just explain very briefly between the three? I don't know where you pick those three uh, and there are many other ones. <clears throat> and I'm not sure I would have picked those three, maybe some of them. The, I think the important thing, uh, first of all, I never give definitions. Also when I teach at university, because students learn definitions and they don't understand. And some people really understand the concept but can give you a formal definition. So let's not um, focus on the formal definitions of different biases and the viewers can Google it and find it in my papers when I'm forced to do that. <clears throat> Generally, we're speaking about a few things. Biases in general are when people go astray, but not randomly, systematically they go astray, not driven by the actual evidence. And that can happen, I would say, you know, eight different uh, sources of bias. It's in one of my papers that recently came out. I believe you have a link on eight sources of bias. I would mention two major ones. One is contextual information where you get, excuse me, an expectation. Yeah, that's a paper and it's uh, open access. So anyone can freely uh, accessible it, publicly accessible <clears throat> to read the paper and the details. Some of those biases derived from an expectation that you get from irrelevant information. So you expect to find something because you know the suspect confessed to the crime, you know this DNA convicting or identifying the person and so on and so forth. So that causes you an expectation before you actually look at the evidence. So this kind of contextual information where you already, your brain expects to find something and the brain sees in a way what it wants to see and ignores things that it doesn't want to see or explain away what doesn't fit your expectation. The human mind is very dynamic, it's very flexible, so it can do that. So this is a kind of a confirmation bias by contextual irrelevant information. So this is kind of a group of phenomena. The other group that I would uh, also mention <clears throat> is when people go backwards. You need to go from the evidence to the suspect. And what happens in fingerprints, in firearm, in DNA, sometimes they go from the suspect to the evidence. So they see the DNA profile of the suspect or the fingerprint of the suspect, and then they go and look for the suspect in the evidence. That's called backward reasoning or backward uh, tracking. You need to start with the evidence. <clears throat> we call it LSU, linear sequential unmasking, start with the actual evidence. The evidence needs to drive your decision making. And after you see the evidence without seeing the suspect, without the reference materials, then you are do the comparison to the uh, actual suspect. I also need to mention that these two group of biases have subgroups and there are other biases and it gets a lot uh, <coughs> complicated. But it's important to emphasize that I'm talking about implicit biases. I'm talking about hardworking, dedicated forensic examiners. And this, many of them get very defensive, defensive aggressive when I say you're biased because it's not people who are intentionally biased. They're not aware of it. They're very hardworking, competent, and they get very annoyed at it because they think they're doing a great job. And they're doing a great job, but they can do a better job if they're a bit open-minded to consider the influences in their decision making, especially in forensic domains that have some discretion, judgment, subjectivity, then those biases are more powerful. Yeah, you often talk about something like the illusion of control, and you say that acknowledging bias can be very helpful. Um, what I, I'm curious about ways to help fix the the bias problem, um, but it, you know. Yeah. What do, what do you have to say about, uh, first of all, first of all, acknowledging the problem, like like an alcoholic, acknowledging they're an alcoholic, right? 
<laughs> That's an example I use quite a lot in my training that, you know, the problem with many alcoholics that they say, I'm not an alcoholic, I just enjoy drinking all the time and I can stop anytime. The minute you acknowledge you're an alcoholic, you're halfway in a moving to recovery and solving your uh, issue with alcohol. So acknowledging that people and experts and you can be biased by irrelevant contextual information or any one of the different uh, eight sources of bias is a great step forward uh, of people to do that. If you don't acknowledge it, we're not going to be able to start dealing. We have what we call the, bi the bias blind spot. It's quite easy to see bias in other people, but harder to see your own biases. So acknowledging is necessary, but it's not sufficient. Many people say, oh, now I know I'm biased. I agree that I can be biased, and I'll try to control it by sheer willpower. By sheer willpower, you cannot control bias. We can't control our thought processes. We all know that, you know, when your boyfriend or girlfriend dumps you, you don't want to think about it. Well, you can't stop thinking about it. In fact, we call it ironic processing. The more you try not to think about it, the stronger the bias. It's like a judge telling the jurors, please ignore that the suspect had a criminal record for murder before. Remember, do not pay attention and do not think that he did a murder. The more he tells them to ignore it, the more the brain takes it into account, subconscious and without awareness. <clears throat> it's so, like somebody, yeah, yeah. It's like somebody saying, don't think about a pink polka dotted elephant or something like that. And then you can't stop thinking about it. <laughs> Absolutely. And you can't unsee what you've seen. So when you're exposed to irrelevant information, you say, okay, I'm not going to take it into account. Once you're exposed, there's no way back on that. So you have to take actual steps to minimize bias. But if people start to acknowledge its existence, then it's already moving ahead. And then, it, then you can start thinking about how do I minimize exposure to irrelevant information? How do I not go backwards? What I mentioned, linear sequential unmasking. And I believe the issue of bias is going to be moving forward quite a bit because ISO, the accreditation, ISO 1720, and even ISO 1725, which is for the more objective domains, now require showing impartiality, freedom from bias. So this is going to be a good pressure. And you need a bit of cognitive background to understand the issues. So some forensic examiners are getting into it, and that's great, but really studying the mind and the brain, it's not something you're going to read a book or 10 books or a year and be able to understand. So if you want to really understand the wider picture and understand the underpinning of bias so you can really effectively deal with it, you need to get a bit more into it, and that requires a bit uh, more effort and get uh, some proper cognitive informed training on these issues. It's interesting here in Canada, uh, on the civil side, they have something called a form 53. And so what that is, is a form that they send to the expert that you have to sign. It's a one page form. And it basically says that your duty is to the court and not to the side that retained you. And I find it interesting because it's just a little piece of paper. You sign it, you send it back, but it has absolutely no bearing whatsoever on whether or not you are. So there's different agencies. Some are going to be labs. They're going to be very big. They have a very big structure and a lot of people. So they can do a lot more of the uh, linear sequential unmasking. And then um, there are, for example, smaller, even private companies or people like myself that are very small. And I get calls sometimes and it'll and I, I do about 50, 50 percent prosecution and defense. And it doesn't matter which side, but I've seen it before. Sometimes they want to tell you about the client or they want to tell you about their, the suspect and how he's such a great person and everything else. So the contextual by like the start is really bad. What can, I'll, I'll say it personally, what can I do when I, I know that it's coming in? I'll tell you what I do. I don't uh, appear a lot in court, but I've been involved in cases in Canada and in the U S and uh, UK and other country for the defense and for the prosecution and the lawyers. I don't want to ascribe intention to them. Probably it's intentional, but regardless if it's intentional or not, the first thing that comes out of their mouth when they talk to me is, let me brief you about the case. Let me give you the background. And that's why I tell them to shut up in a polite way as much as I can, which is not a lot of time. And I say, please don't tell me the background, because if you tell me the, back the background, you're going to bias me. I want you to just give me the relevant information 
that you need me to look into. And it's very interesting because years later I hear about the cases and I didn't know a lot of the uh, irrelevant information. Now, there was a case where they gave me the information and then they said, well, don't take it into account. I said, I'm really sorry. You gave me this information. You burnt me. I can't delete it from my mind by mere willpower. And I said, I'm not taking your case because they provided me with uh, irrelevant contextual information. But you can tell them uh, not to say that. And if you want <clears throat> a practical, even though I'm very academic and I live in the ivory tower, I'm a very practical person. If you tell the lawyer to shut up or the forensic examiner tells the police detective to shut up, they're going to get into trouble, right? What you want to tell them is say, look, before you say anything to me, this issue of bias is very strong now. There's this crazy doctor, doctor draw talking about it, and they're going to ask me in court. When I testify in court, the other side is going to say, what did they brief you? What did you know about the case? And they're going to make me look bad and biased. I want to help you, and I can help you better if you don't tell me all the briefing that you know I don't need just to make me, you know, feel sympathy to the client or to the victim, whatever the case. So if they know that you're going to testify, they're going to be cross-examining you on that. And in fact, even without cross-examining, I call for reports. When you write a report, to write everything you knew, right? What irrelevant contextual information you knew about the case and some laboratories have adopted it and require it so you tell them before you say anything on the phone to me before you email me know that i'm going to disclose what you're telling me don't make me and you look bad like you told me like you won't believe some lawyers what they say uh, is a, i'm not talking about information they say you know this is a scum of earth may burn in hell help me convict this person and all this stuff know that it's not between you and I anymore uh, and under the table. So these are different techniques to minimize that. But, you know, you guys, you and other people can come up with your own techniques as, as good as I, maybe better than I, as long as you acknowledge that it can affect you subconsciously and you understand some of the cognitive mechanisms that underpin that, and you can develop new techniques and you can adapt them to big labs or small labs. And depending if you work for the police or you do work for the defense, it's all different manifestation of the same basic cognitive mechanism. Well, I probably have to thank you because on two occasions, I actually testified at trial. And one in particular, the, the, the defense lawyer asked me very specifically, are you aware of what cognitive bias is? And uh, I was very fairly well prepared. Let's put it that way. And I said, yes, I do. There's been papers. There's Dr. Etil Drawer. He has this and this. And after I, I rang off a list of papers and, and people, uh, he didn't ask me any more questions. But I think the point about Ed, uh, is a very good point is that if you acknowledge that it can happen and that there probably is some influence externally, you can try to mitigate it. I know here one of the things that we try to do is when we receive information um, from a case, sometimes we have, I hand the data off to somebody else in my office, but I let them work independently without me. I'm sort of like the filter. I don't let them know everything that I know. And then we work independently and then we bring our numbers back together after, and then we compare. Um, so I know that you have some recommendations for the way that the information is handed off to the people doing the work. So if you're a latent print expert, uh, and maybe you can talk something about this is how you, you know, the supervisor can maybe limit or filter some of the information. So, yes, so many things going on. I'm trying to be a bit organized. So one of the things is who will filter out the information to decide what's relevant and irrelevant. You don't want the police detective to do that. So depending on a lot of the structure of the lab, we have many solutions to that. One of them is uh, what we call a case manager. In a case manager, you have someone who gets all the information and decides what's relevant or not and gives it to another examiner. So now I'm the case manager. I get everything, right? and then I give you what is relevant. Now, everybody wants to be a case manager, so we can rotate in one uh, instance. I'm a case manager, and I give you the relevant information. In another case, you're the case manager. You decide what's relevant or not. 
Now remember that it's not only the case manager important at the beginning to filter out information, but often once you write the report and reach your forensic conclusion, the detective doesn't always know how it relates to the case. They need a bit of translation, what the forensic findings mean about the case. So the case manager not only works at the beginning in terms of filtering information, but later they meet with a detective and explain the findings and what it may mean to the activity level and to the case itself. But the actual forensic examiner making the decision is not part of it. That's a case manager, the go between, uh, between the detectives and all the information and the people actually making the decisions themselves. Okay. I wanted to ask you about other ways that maybe things could improve, like, for example, proficiency testing. What what kind of things can people do in their proficiency tests? Because I've seen some proficiency tests and they are like, some of them are, well, I got to be careful what I say. They're just, let's put it this way. They're not challenging. They're extremely basic. They're, they're not meant to challenge a person who is you know experienced or has been doing the job for some time but what can you include in a proficiency test that may assist uh you know what you're talking about this again is a very big and important question proficiency testing and error rate studies and i just have a paper that came last week in forensic science international synergy again it's open access on a uh, error rate and having a, a paper in a uh, for a uh, the journal, uh, like that, uh, forensic, journal of Forensic Sciences called The Error in Error Rate. Uh, that's the title uh, of uh, the paper. So there's a, a huge amount of challenges and problems in proficiency testing and in, a, yeah, that's a one. Um, where, first of all, do they mimic, are they similar to casework? in terms of the difficulty, in terms of including inconclusive evidence, in terms of what do you do when someone said inconclusive decisions, in terms of people know they're being tested versus being tested when they think it's casework. I always give the example that I don't drive according to the speed limit all the time, but when I'm in a driving test or I know there's a police officer with a police camera or whatever, I drive by the speed limit. You know, people behave very differently. And um, so we have that. We have a whole range, you know, the, the issue of bias during error rate and proficiency testing. They just look at the evidence and not kind of with contextually relevant information, which happens in a lot of the casework. So the proficiency testing error rate studies are a good step. We need them, but they require, uh, and I say it in a British way, they require quite a lot of improvement with a lot of issues. Some of the issues are just very, very challenging to design them properly. So it's very big, big uh, question. Uh, Hello, are you there? Yeah, I'm here, I'm here. Oh. Yeah, Are you falling asleep? Am I boring you? You disappeared already. No, no, not at all. In fact, uh, as you were speaking, I wanted to bring up, uh, you, you've, we've got some really good references for some of the people here. So um, this one here, Biases in Forensic Experts, it, it's only, it's a very short article, but I think it, it's a good first read uh, if people are interested in some information. Uh, the one that you had talked about before, Cognitive and Human Factors and Expert Decision Making, Six Fallacies and Eight Sources of Bias. This is a really good paper, open access, like you said, uh, goes through a lot of detail, um, you know, some of the things you're actually uh, speaking about now. Um, let me ask you then, so from, you know, when you first started until now, well, let's not even go back that far. Let's let's talk about the next uh, or the past, let's say even five years or, or up until now. Have you seen... Uh, sort of an accelerated rate of uh, acknowledgement and people trying to implement more uh, devices in their systems to try and avoid this kind of thing? Or is there still some battles you see? Do you still get resistance? What what can you tell me about how people have been adopting and implementing some of these things? <clears throat> First of all, generally speaking, a huge step forward. Uh, and I compare it also to the medical and other domain, how long it takes them to take on board uh, certain things or the military. And um, so the forensic community, the forensic domain, generally speaking, huge transformation. You don't recognize the domain, what it was only, you know, 10, 15 years ago, how it's moved forward. 
some of it by people being open-minded and wanting to change some of it because people see you know the wind is changing it comes up in court and they have no choice and they're trying to put an old book in a new cover but huge changes and the court of taking it on board in the uk for example we have a forensic science regulator and she's taking it on board <clears throat> so huge huge change other battles are oh, definitely there are still many many battles in certain domains there are still a huge amount of resistance to this and people get very emotional and defensive aggressive so there's still a long way to go but the forensic community generally speaking has really really moved forward in a positive way and i do get some battles you know i was in a conference and people get up and start screaming before they understand uh, what is said and so on and so forth because it gets very defensive when they hear bias they think it's like racism and sexism and anti-semitism they don't understand what cognitive bias it happens to the best of us and i always try to emphasize it and so on and so forth so i think uh, uh the overall i don't want to give a uh, mark so great to the forensic community but i would say that it has went leap and bounce in taking it on board and not only bias but other cognitive factors, human factors that affect performance, whether it's fatigue and many other influences that didn't exist are really moving. So the forensic community is really done well, but still there are, uh, you can call them dinosaurs, but there's some very powerful dinosaurs, you know, who still <laughs> resist it and fight it and uh, so on and so forth. Yeah, well, I think... Bias is one of these things when somebody says, well, you're biased right away. There's this guard, there's a shield that comes up because you don't want to be seen as a, especially when you're a forensic expert, you don't want to be seen as this person that sways one way or the other. So I can see that, but I think I more think people actually, are, are. Before that, yes to what you're saying, but add two other ingredients. Nobody likes to be called biased, but first of all, they don't like an outsider. The forensic science community is very neat and they don't want some cognitive scientist like me, a weird guy to begin with coming and telling them an outsider. And also I have a lot of sympathy to the forensic examiners because in Canada, in the UK, in the US, in many countries, it's an adversarial legal system. So every time you acknowledge the weakness, which is good to improve, the other side is going to eat you alive in court or the cross examine. You said, you acknowledge that you make mistakes. You acknowledge that you're biased and use it against you. And the adversarial system is not only not scientific, it's basically anti-scientific. So I think the forensic exam is in a very difficult situation of wanting to move forward. You have to acknowledge your weaknesses. You have to improve and know when you are wrong. We all make mistakes, but the adversary system makes it very, very problematic to do that. So all what you said is correct. Add this to it, and you understand why the forensic examiners have, and some still do, uh, have that uh, issue. Okay. Are, are you able to talk about anything that you're currently working on or want to work on in the future? Like what kinds of things you can maybe talk about uh, you know where this where, where this area is going or where you're trying to go with this whole area yes i would say a, a number of directions there are many things <clears throat> going on one is that bias doesn't only impact the interpretation of the results bias can impact what the results are because it affects how you sample, your testing strategies, when to stop looking. It not only can affect what the results are in addition to the interpretation of the results, but it can even affect what the data are, because, and I have a few examples in the paper on the eight sources of bias, where I show the strengths of the bias in impacting not only the interpretation of the results, also, we're looking not only on bias, but reliability, even without bias, how consistent are examiners with one, one another, regardless of bias, even without bias, how consistent is one examiner to another on the same evidence? This is what we call between inter-examiner differences. But even the same examiner looking at the same data same evidence can reach different conclusions even in fingerprints you know there's a study showing that 10 percent of the time the same fingerprint examiner looking at the same pair of prints would reach a different conclusion 
even without bias. So that issue of reliability is even lower than bias. Bias is on top of it, but even without context, even without irrelevant context, different examiners reach different conclusion, and the same examiner can reach the same conclusion. Another domain that I'm working on uh, is forensic pathology. They're very resistant to that. They're medical doctors. They want to know everything. And uh, we're having some very interesting studies on this right now that will be coming out soon that I'm sure you will hear about because they show uh, certain biases that uh, are problematic, to say the least. Well, well, what about experience? I mean, uh, if if the observer, if, if the person themselves can change their conclusions based on some kind of bias or whatever, what about experience? I mean, could, it, I can imagine a, a, a newbie can probably perform better than the experienced person in some cases or vice versa, or I don't know, but what, what do you have to say about experience? Generally, experience in expert domains, and I work again in many expert domains, is very good. But many times, ignorance is bliss. Novices, we have a whole series of articles where novices surpassed experts. We even have in the paper on the eight sources of bias, have a forensic example where novices surpassed experts in forensic decisions. So experts is generally good, but novices also bring a lot of things to the table. And also experience can cause people to start, you know, you start low and experience, you go high, high, but then you don't continue to go up forever or stay, you can even go down. So experience sometimes causes you what we call metacognitive issues, over self-confidence. You get very confident with yourself and overconfident. So experience is a mixed bag and against quite a complicated issue. And I'm sorry, I feel terrible saying, you know, this is complicated, this is complicated. Yes, but the human mind and the brain is a complicated thing, how people take and make decisions. And we haven't even talked about technology, how technology is getting more and more prevalent in medicine, in aviation, in forensic sciences. And it's not like the human is out of the picture. We have what we call distributed cognition when the human offloads some of the processes onto technology and tools, or there's collaboration and the work as partners, that introduces a lot of issues. And technology doesn't cause bias to go away. It hides the biases, it introduces new biases. So this is another issue that we can spend another hour only on that and scratch the surface. So there's a lot of work to do. It's very interesting, it's very important. And you know, the forensic examiners are doing a very important piece in the criminal justice and in civil cases, you know, and that's very important for us and important for society. Well, that you know, you said technology and that's actually was gonna be one of my questions to you. And that is, I mean, people are using more technology in their work, but from your perspective, is there any technology that could assist with limiting bias, making decisions, artificial intelligence, these types of things? Do you see an opportunity there? Absolutely, technology can help, but can, you know, between can and does is a big difference. So technology can help, A. Technology may not help or not make it worse. And technology can make it much, much worse, uh, make the biases worse. And many people say, well, I use a computer, I use AI, then there's no bias, when in fact there is bias in the technology, whether it's AFIS or face recognition. There's also a general issue on technology, how it affects a human examiner. And I'm writing a paper now, not in forensic science, how technology is making us more stupid, how technology has decreased human intelligence because of, uh, very, again, um, like a broken record, it's very complicated, but technology uh, impacts how we think, how we communicate, and doesn't eliminate biases. It can be a very helpful tool, but it can also cause problems. So it's not one way or the other. It's a tool and depends how it's used, how it's developed, and if it's built correctly to interact with the human examiners. Okay. I have I have this thing that I always say now, it happened in the last few years, but I call it the hierarchy of evidence. And that has to do with, you know, when you have a, a really pristine sample of something, you know, you have great information, and then what happens when that begins to deteriorate. So, and what you can say about it, the difficulties that are involved. How does, how does evidence play a role in this? 
a huge uh, a huge role there is what i call the bias danger zone you started asking me how big is a problem of bias well many times people ignore bias and get all defensive it doesn't exist and some people overreact and think there's bias everywhere and they want to kill a fly with a cannon so what you need to do is to know when you're in the bias danger zone if you go back to my example of driving i speed but when I'm tired, you know, I just landed in Canada, I'm not sure which side of the road to drive on, or I had a glass of wine, or whatever, I st- or there's snow or ice on the road, then I slow down. And this is what the forensic examiners need to do once they get an understanding and training about cognitive bias, understand when they are in the bias danger zone, what I call the bias danger zone. And one of the critical elements in the bias danger zone is the evidence. When the evidence is, as you said, is very clear, it's, you know, there's good quantity and quality of information, you're not near the threshold, it's an easy decision, then there's not a lot of leeway for bias to impact your decision. As the decision is more difficult, you have more judgment, more uh, discretion, you're near the borderline, it's a more difficult case, you know, you as as a a forensic examiner, no, sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's not easy. As it's more difficult, then the bias has more power to influence you. That is an important ingredient in the bias danger zone. What about when, let's say, for example, you have, you've done your analysis, what about the delivery of the evidence to the jury? So the output and how it's transmitted. Um, do you ever see any cases where, for example, you could take, I don't know, let's just say a, a piece of evidence, but it's pushed this way or it's pushed that way, depending on, you know what I mean, the, the, the situation? Absolutely. And unfortunately, the jurors and even professional judges are often convinced not by the scientific merit, but how you present the evidence in court. And what forensic examiners often do, they try to present the evidence as strong as possible, rather than presenting the actual strengths of the evidence. And they have training, you know, how to appear in court, and they train them, look at the jury's eyes, and, you know, speak with confidence, and so on and so forth. No, you shouldn't speak with confidence. You should speak in confidence, depending on the strength of the evidence, I remember I appeared in court once and they asked me some questions. So I was very confident and I said, yes, absolutely. And then he asked me a question and I knew the answer was yes, but it was not as powerful. And I could have just said yes, but intentionally I wanted to convey to the jewel that it's not as strong. So I said, mm, let me think about it for a minute. Mm, yes. And I deliberately did it. Because the way I present it to the Jews needs to reflect the strengths of the evidence. If we go back to your example a few minutes ago, some cases are difficult, some cases are easy. This needs to be transmitted. You shouldn't always, in court, be as persuasive as you can based on your training how to appear in court. You need to present your confidence in accordance to the strengths of the evidence. And this is very, very critical uh, for the jurors who take it more by how you present it and not what you say as much. If you say, you know, I've been doing it for 20 years and I'm telling you this is an identification, they're gonna believe you. And so this presentation is a big issue, but it's a different issue. One issue is let's get the forensic decision as accurate, as reliable, as impartial, and as objective as possible. And then how do we convey it effectively to the Jews in a way that they understand because they don't understand science. Most of the judges, you know, I trained all the superior judges in the state of Massachusetts. And when I started, I asked how many have background in social sciences, in humanities, almost all of them, not many have scientific background. Also, you have to remember, and again, I'm just showing the complexity, science is complicated. The jurors and the court is not complicated because they want black and white. They need to say, you know, the person accused of the crime, is the suspect guilty or not guilty? It's a binary decision. And the evidence is not always, yes, it's a match, 100% match, it cannot be wrong, or it's definitely an exclusion. You know, there's a... 
and if you get, I don't want to get even to talk about statistics and so on. So science is just a bit more complicated than yes, no, but the jurors and the judge, it, it, at the end of the day, to make a decision, guilty or not guilty. And again, how to communicate to the jurors the strength of the evidence and the science and the complexity is another huge issue uh, that is, of course, is a lot of cognitive and psychological issues, how to convey it. But my message today to the forensic community, which is not a new message, when you appear in court, don't do the best you can, because you can do a very, very, very convincing job. Do a convincing job when the evidence is convincing, when the evidence is strong, but not as convincing, don't do the best you can in looking in the eyes of the jury and being confident. Do less to give the jurors the right understanding of the evidence. And a lot of it is not in the objective data that you give them and you count, you know, this and give them numbers. It's how you speak and how you look at them, the tone of your voice. So you need to uh, think about it and say, you know, it's complicated. It's not clearly cut. You know, it's not a simply match or not match or an identification and so on and so forth. Yeah. A lot of these areas that you're talking about are... Uh identification or they're very black and white so is it this person is it not is it this you know this person's fingerprint is it not is it um, uh, in forensic uh, anthropology is it a male or a female something like this in in the world that I work I'm often dealing with uh, not no, not so much an error rate but just error and uncertainty so for example I'm trying to measure where a bloodstain pattern uh, an impact pattern came from and it's not black and white as if you know, there's no right or wrong answer. It's a matter of how far you are from the ground truth. And, you know, unfortunately, when it's a crime scene, you never have the ground truth. You don't really know unless there's a video camera or something. But in that case, they wouldn't need me. So what about, well, I kind of, maybe this is a comment more than a question, but I've seen it before where we don't, uh, and this might be an interesting uh, research project where, for example, people are, are given a project to calculate something, but given some contextual information, does the error, the range or the uncertainty get smaller and wider depending on, you know, the, the, the contextual information? And I don't know if you've seen that. And there are two issues here. The contextual information will cause the examiners to reach more consensus but it may be for the wrong reasons. And the consensus doesn't mean they have the true answer. That's why we don't know the ground truth. We have to build databases where we know the ground truth and how you build the database and the complexities in the paper that you mentioned, the error in error rate in building those databases. But the fact that contextual information increases consensus, you know, you can all flip a coin and we all agree heads one thing tells another, but it doesn't mean it's true. The question is not only the reliability, the consistency, but the validity, do you reach the right uh, answer? And to do that, among other things, we need to know the ground truth, which we do not know in case work. So we have to build databases. Uh, with fingerprints, it's very easy. With firearms, it's very easy. With a blood pattern analysis, it's a bit more complicated because you can't take a person and shoot one person from one angle and shoot another person from another angle and get, you know, your pattern, the blood uh, splatter, and know the ground truth and so on. So it's a issue, and it's, as you say, project. What is important is to do those projects and that forensic science existed for decades and decades and decades in court without any research. If you look at the research, a lot of forensic domain bias, reliability, but even the scientific basis, forget about bias and reliability in the cognitive and the human factors, just the basic scientific underpinning has never been done in many forensic domains and it appeared in court. So now they're catching up which is very good, but of course it's very problematic for people who have been doing, presenting in court and doing something for 20 years. Now they're going to do research, is it valid or not? Is it reliable or not? That's kind of putting, you know, the wagon in front of the horse. It should be the other way around. But if you look at the literature in many domains, most of the literature is from, you know, from the last 10 years or so. So there's a lot, a lot of projects, a lot, a lot of data collection to do, and a lot of understanding to improve forensic science because it's a uh, science. I can't hear you. I did it again. For those that want to learn more, for those that want to, um, um, you know, 
just be more aware of what's going on. You you offer training, or I think you do some workshops. I mean, you travel with COVID now. I guess it's a little bit of a problem, but um, what are the options for people that want to get training in this area? So when I used to travel and will travel again, or maybe someday, I limited myself to once a month because I'm a researcher. I'm not somebody who just does training. I could do training all the time. I get quite a lot from all over the world and I could just go into training, but I'm a researcher and just feel I need to communicate. I don't want to be in the ivory tower like many academics and not impact the real world. Now, uh, with the virus and everything, we do online uh, training just uh, to self-advertise, you know, the uh, ANAB, the ANSI National Accreditation Board, has organized training on October uh, 20, just over a month. We're doing a five-hour uh, training on forensic decision-making. You can go to my webpage and look at events and the, the link there. So we do training, and I do a lot of training for, for labs, whole labs I've done during the virus in the last six months. I've done quite a lot of online training from an hour to five hours to a day to two days. Uh, on uh, these issues. So this is our information on forensic identification. If you go to the link events, uh, there's uh, quite a lot of events and I'm happy to add events and uh, people can join events. Some uh, events are free. If people want to, uh, there's webinars. That, uh, you mentioned it's uh, Forensic Week next week. Yes. I'm giving a free webinar. It's on the webpage. You can... Uh, click on the link, people can go to the free webinar, but also more training courses, you know, that are longer and in-depth, because an hour or two of training is really just a, like, you know, an appetizer, just a taste. If you really want to get into it, you need more. And the A and AB, the National Accreditation Board, 20 of October, I'm doing it. And I do a, a lot of training. People are welcome to email me, not about training, but also if you have any questions, you can find my email on the internet. Uh, you can Google my name. It's weird enough. You'll find me uh, quickly and find my email. And if you have any questions or what articles, I'll be happy to send it uh, to you because I believe that dialogue between academics and practitioners is the way forward. And the academics sit in the ivory tower and talk to one another. That's great, but they don't impact the real world. When the practitioners sit with one another and talk, that's nice, but they need external academic input and by collaborating interacting this is how i hope we'll be moving forward and not only hope we've been doing uh, you've been doing a great job for over a decade we just need to continue excellent one last thing before we go you have a paper that was uh, i believe just released last week misuse of measurements in forensic science can you just say a couple of words on that well that's going to be a bit of a controversial <laughs> paper but not my first one We've looked at all the error rate studies and found that all the error rate studies are misleading in reflecting error because they don't include casework. Or, for example, when they do an error rate study, if the examiner says inconclusive, they don't count it in an error. In fact, they count it as a correct response. So if you go to an error rate study and they tell you, you this is an error rate study, and if you say inconclusive, it's a correct response, then People make a lot of inconclusive decisions. If you look at our paper, we find error rate studies that have 50% or 80 or 90% of the answers were inconclusive, and they count all of them as correct responses. They never count inconclusive as even potentially incorrect, and so on and so forth. So in this paper, we highlight the weaknesses in the design of the error rate studies and how to solve it. It's very easy. We have a very practical designs of how you can have more accurate error rate studies. But this new paper, <clears throat> again, it's open access in Forensic Science International Synergy of Misuse of Scientific Measurements in Forensic Science, showing, and that will take us back to proficiency testing, how you can actually test human performance. And it's painful because if you find errors, you know, it's going to be used against you in court, and that's a problem. And I'm not, you know, saying it's not a problem, but if you don't acknowledge it and you say, you know, we're not alcoholic or cigarette is good for you, we're not going to move forward. We have to acknowledge and do this research. And we find that in the error rate studies, again, people can read the paper. It's uh, publicly, freely available and make their own mind up. But we show some very serious problems with all the error rate studies and how to fix it 
but then we're going to get errors a bit higher than until now, which is not a comfortable reading for anyone, but we have to do that. Okay. Dr. Dror, I want to say thank you so much for uh, being here today. I realize it's later in the UK and appreciate your time. You always have so much to say and I wish we had more time, but I try to limit this because there's people at work right now and they're probably looking at their watches maybe. But uh, if you if you don't mind, just hang on because I'm going to come back and just want to chat with you for a couple of minutes while I just do a closing here. Okay. So thank, thank you very much. much for inviting me and giving me this uh, opportunity to talk to you and to the community. I appreciate that. All right. Great. Thank you. All right, folks. Well, that uh, concludes episode four. Uh, next week, we're going to have Dr. Jeffrey Desmoulin. He's a biomechanical engineer, and he does incident reconstruction and physical testing with a subspecialty in the science of violence. Now, uh, Dr. Desmoulin, you may know him from the hit television show, The Deadliest Warrior, and that's where they take weapons and things like that, and they measure forces, and they use accelerometers and all kinds of technology. And uh, uh, Jeff does some really interesting work in terms of biomechanics and officer-involved shootings in a number of different cases. So make sure you join us. It's Thursdays at 2 p.m. Eastern. Thank you very much, or thank you very much, everyone, and uh, we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.